Does archaeology prove that Joseph was real? Well, welcome to this episode of Prophetic Perspective. We're delighted to have Dr. Douglas Petrovich, an expert in ancient Near Eastern languages and in archaeology, and really connecting the dots of the Old Testament as demonstrably true even in archaeology and the research you found. Doug, tell us a little bit of what, what you've discovered about the Exodus, about the uh, Jewish history in Egypt and beyond. Well, you know, Tim, one of the laughingstocks in universities around the world has always been the lack of evidence for Israelites in Egypt for the 430 years that the Bible describes that they were there. It says that very clearly in Exodus 12, 40, and 41. Right. So what's amazing is that there's evidence both of Joseph's lifetime and of Moses' lifetime. And in Joseph's lifetime, a perfect example is, um, and of course, in my PhD from the University of Toronto, my first minor was Egyptian language, which means hieroglyphics. So I found in, in Egyptian hieroglyphic inscriptions the identification of five biblical figures, Jacob, Joseph, his two oldest sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, the oldest, and one of Manasseh's obscure sons named Shechem. So in, in inscriptions like this, we're able to see the very figures in the Bible uh, that are, um, you know, that, that kind of jump off the page. Um, as well, during Moses' lifetime, there's evidence connected to the 10th plague on Egypt, which consists of animal burials from the time of Amenhotep II, who clearly is the Exodus Pharaoh. And so those animals include the four animals that were found, uh, in, the, in the book of Exodus in chapters 11 and 12, dogs, cattle, sheep, and goats. And the majority are sheep and goats, and they're found uh, having been buried in their first year of age. Many of them were uh, killed by a, a blow, a, a merciful blow to the back of the head, showing that it was a purposeful killing. So all of this fits perfectly, of course, with the Passover event and the instruction the, the Israelites had that they were to take... Um, an unblemished sheep yep. or goat, and, and kill it, and then eat some of the meat. Not all of it, it wasn't a feast, but just to eat from some small amount of it. And that's why we see these carcasses literally um, buried in many places throughout the palatial district. And of course, that's where the palaces are. So probably if they were to excavate the areas on the site where there were um, commu Jewish, Jewish communities actually living, they would find a lot more, but there are already these four animals found in the area right around the palace itself. I love the story of Joseph because it is so instructive to us even today. And the fact that Joseph had a life that was filled with ups and downs. I mean, he went to the pit of despair, so to speak, and literally being cast into a dungeon, but he never lost faith. And even when the opportunity arose for him to be faithful to God, he wasn't dejected. He wasn't, uh, you know, just downcast. He was looking for a way to still be faithful. And so he rose back up to prominence. But when he came to the greatest prominence, serving as Pharaoh's number two man in the kingdom, he was given a new Egyptian name, uh, Zephanath Panea. And I even love what that name means in Egyptian. And you'd be the expert here more than me. But scripture tells us that the definition of that name is God speaks, he lives. In other words, Joseph's life and his testimony of the living God convinced this pagan ruler, Pharaoh, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lives, he speaks, and he has clearly spoken through this young man. And so that same God still lives, he still speaks today through his word and through the testimony of those who are faithful to him. And you know what I found about Joseph, Tim? There are five Egyptian names, uh, I'm sorry, there are five total names for Joseph, one being Hebrew and the other four being Egyptian. One of them is recorded in the Bible and the other I found, the other names I found oh, for Joseph. You gotta I tell found. me, what is yeah. it? And so, um, he has, he has two names that he's given shortly after the events that we read about with what, the, the citation you just gave. Um, after Joseph already has established himself in Egypt and he has prepared the, the nation for the famine, and what he did to do this was he, he filtered water from an offshoot of the Nile called the Bar Yusuf. He filtered that water to the west the Bar in, Yusuf. Yeah, There's, the Bar Yusuf. Interesting, <laughs> if, isn't yeah, it? Interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, and essentially, it's it's a it's it's a plain, but um, he he filtered it in, um, there in such a way that he built this dike that allowed a controlled amount of water to flow inside this this valley, and essentially it was 
it was the best irrigated land in all of Egypt, and some would even say the entire ancient Near East. So from then until now, it's been, until, at least till the 20th century, this area, it's called the Fayum, has been Egypt's breadbasket. The Roman Empire survived on the breadbasket of Egypt in the Fayum because of the am amazing amount of grain that could be cultivated there. So this is really important. But um, So after Joseph did all of this, he, we, we read about two names that he gets. Okay, one of them is, um, and I'm just going to give the English translation. Sure. The king of the gods is at the forefront. Think about that for a minute. The king of the gods is at the forefront. What happened when Joseph was about to interpret the dream for, for Pharaoh the king? Remember, he was in the dungeon, he was all dirty and yes. had a beard, and they shaved him and cleaned him all up, bathed him, stuck him in front of the king. Before he even heard the two dreams that the king wanted, heard and and interpreted, Joseph said this, he said this, it is not in me, it is not in me. God will give to Pharaoh a favorable answer. So we all know Joseph was going to interpret those dreams, wasn't he? Yes. 100%. He knew he was going to interpret the dreams, but what did he do before he even heard them? Gave credit to God. Gave credit to God and moved it away from himself. What does he do? He puts the king of the gods at the forefront. That's why they called him this. And in the ancient world, you didn't receive your names at birth, Tim. You received them when something in life distinguished you. And there's another name that's really important, Sa Sobek. It's translation, son of the God who provides for Egypt through the life-giving waters of the Nile. Doesn't that describe him perfectly? Yes, it does. With the, the offshooting of the water in the dike at, at Lahoon from, from the Bar Yusuf uh, to, to create this cultivatable land. So then later in his life, the two names are conflated into one so that it's uh, Sobek M. Chat, the God who provides for Egypt through life-giving waters of the Nile is at the forefront. That's his name at the end of his life. My goodness, you know, and the beautiful thing about Joseph is even as he testified to his brothers who he could have been very resentful toward, he could have actually sought revenge toward, but he said, even you sending me here was not just your plan. It was God's plan for me to be able to preserve your life. So Joseph does become a type of Jesus Christ. He is one who extends the life-giving, not just waters of the Nile, but the life-giving providence and blessing of God to the Jews and to the nations. And so the fact that Joseph's uh, providence of, of foresight in creating that dike and that, that life-giving water there and lasted for generations and hundreds and hundreds of years. And to this day, we respond to what God revealed through Joseph and what the Egyptians understood, at least for that time, until they drifted. And so today, obviously our viewers, whatever their circumstance, can be one who is pointing and giving credit to God and extending that life-giving testimony of Jesus Christ. That's right. Wow. Well, Doug, thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to having you again and sharing more prophetic perspectives.